going on an adventure. So there's only one way to figure it all out. Unzip the archaeology. Make it naked. Ron, you, you got the maps? Yes, I have the map. The mission is to find Mount Sinai. Look at, look at the map. Here's a pass, right? One main road, the two central routes. For hundreds of years, adventurers have been searching for the real Mount Sinai, the holy mountain where Moses led his followers at the time of the Exodus after escaping from slavery in Egypt. It was on Mount Sinai that, according to the Bible, Moses received the Ten Commandments from God, the sacred laws the Israelites would take with them to the Promised Land. The Bible says that for one year, Hundreds of thousands of Israelites and other followers of Moses camped at the base of the holy mountain. It describes Sinai in detail, providing valuable clues for any modern-day explorer to follow. Why then has the mountain been so difficult to locate? Well, quite simply, people haven't put all the available clues together. That's the other candidate for Mount Sinai, right? From the Until side. now. Yeah. Okay, let's go. We've put together the ultimate Sinai search posse. <laughs> Taking a systematic and logical approach to the biblical text, can finally begin the ultimate quest for the real Mount Sinai. Okay, so here's the thing. If you're gonna search for Mount Sinai, you gotta go where everybody goes. The monastery of Santa Caterina in the southern Sinai. It's worth checking out because that's where Everybody goes, popes, presidents. They go to Santa Caterina, kind of a Mount Sinai tourist trap. Santa Caterina is a third century Christian monastery built under the shadow of what many people believe to be Mount Sinai. The Bible says that God appeared to Moses at the foot of Mount Sinai and spoke to him from a burning bush. You look inside the Katerina Monastery and you find one big bush. Katerina is a high mountain in the South Sinai Peninsula, and this is where the tourists flock. Its incredibly steep and conspicuous peaks certainly make the mountain impressive. But that's where the case for Katerina begins to crumble. Moses was 80 years old at the time he climbed Mount Sinai. Katerina would have posed an extremely difficult feat for the old guy. And in fact, when we consider Katerina's characteristics, we find it doesn't fit a single biblical criteria. The best clues in our search for Mount Sinai can be found in the good book itself. You know what I find amazing? That people actually don't read the text. It says explicitly that it has to have a plateau where you can gather, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. You can have a rock concert then, right? What else? Well, it should be a water source. Water source. I'm glad you mentioned that. What else? It has to be accessible. Uh, how do you spell accessible? KCC. Yeah, accessible. Santa Caterina just isn't checking out with our criteria. It's nowhere near the land of Israel where the Israelites were headed and there's not a single plateau that could have accommodated hundreds of thousands of Israelites. And since it's surrounded by granite, there's hardly any shrubbery to sustain flocks or water to sustain people. And there's one more important characteristic Katerina lacks. Mount Sinai has to be on the actual route of the Exodus, the route that the Israelites took out of Egypt, across the Sinai, 
and into the Promised Land, modern Israel. As they followed Moses into the desert, there were only four main routes the Israelites could have taken, the northern, the southern, and two central routes. Santa Caterina is way down in the southern Sinai on the southern route, but it's a long roundabout route to Israel. If you were, if you were Moses, you're leading, according to the Bible, 600,000 fighting men, meaning if you throw in women and children, plus three million people, whatever it is, even if it's 100,000 people, it's still not you're up go. here, you're up here. <laughs> you're gonna go all the way down here, mm -hmm. trek into the, the mountain. mountain. You're cross yeah. the river, and, and Moses would have to be an expert mountain climber. Yeah. There'd be no- Our posse does not yourself. believe that Sinai will be found on the longest and most difficult route to the Promised Land. Well, there's a big war raging in the area. I asked David Feynman to join the posse. He's an expert tracker when it comes to the route of the Exodus. Itself, the Israelites left Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea, and they started initially to march northwards along the most direct route. But God tells Moses to turn them around because they will see war and get scared and run back to Egypt. So they turn southwards and they Professor Feynman explained to me that because of war, the northern route was abandoned, and the extremely difficult terrain and length of the southern route made it impossible to travel in a short amount of time. That left only the two central routes, which combined to form a single road leading to the Promised Land. And this road is an ancient road. There are water systems all along it. That was the road which Moses would have taken leading the Israelites out to the revelation on Mount Sinai. So where is the mountain of God? Well, Professor Feynman believes he knows, and he says the coordinates have been available to us for well over 2,000 years. Search posse, Professor Feynman, and he believes the best candidate for Mount Sinai is a mountain now called Sin Bisher. Feynman supports this claim based on his interpretation of the clues he says can be found in the biblical story of the Exodus. Exodus chapter 3 starts Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father in law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I am concerned about their suffering. So you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. So where was the mountain of God? It was three days' journey from Egypt. So in the Bible, Moses says to Pharaoh when they're negotiating, you know, Moses says, let my people go. He says, let my people go a three days' journey into the desert. We'll worship our God on the mountain there, and then we'll come back. So, people have chosen Mount Sin Bisher, because it just happens to be on the highway, pretty close to modern-day Cairo. So Sin Bisher is three days' journey from Egypt, and it's on the ancient route of the Exodus. But many scholars say that Moses was not referring to Mount Sinai when dealing with Pharaoh and he simply used the three days journey as a negotiating tactic. Meaning that after Moses led his people out of Egypt, he would have never set up permanent camp so close to his enslavers. The Israelites would have then been sitting ducks for the Egyptians. So it was a bluff. Moses was never serious about this three days journey, and that doesn't refer to Mount Sinai. Now, he doesn't mention Mount Sinai at that point. He had no intention of actually 
going three days journey, worshiping, and then coming back and being slaves in Egypt. It was a bluff that's throwing everybody off. And there's something else that has to be considered, a very important characteristic that Sinbisher lacks. The Bible says that Mount Sinai was a holy mountain. And even before God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, it was considered a place of worship. Now this is an important archeological tip because all holy mountains in the desert are surrounded by sites displaying symbols of worship. These sites often contain ancient rock arrangements and petroglyphs. And since we know from the Bible that Mount Sinai was a holy mountain, that means we can narrow the search down. We can look at those mountains that have places where people worship, that we can see, that have been excavated, and that we can tell that people worshiped here for thousands of years. Sinbisher has no archeological evidence that it was ever a place of worship. So I've crossed off Sinbisher from the list. And I've added to my Sinai posse the quintessential expert on mountain sanctuaries and petroglyphs. Uzi Avner. Uzi has studied in detail over 150 sites across the Sinai. Now, what's amazing to me is you're telling me this stuff, these stones have stood here for 8,000 years? Close to 8,000 years. Uzi taught me how to recognize different types of sites, and he gave me some clues on where we might search for Mount Sinai. First of all, the archaeological indications are a few different types of religious sites. There are many sites with standing stones or pillars, what you read usually in uh, uh, translations of the Bible. The biblical word, which is also commonly used in uh, uh, English literature, is matsevot. So you find many matsevot sites uh, around these mountains. It means something about the attitude of the ancients to these mountains. Uzi has studied over 20 candidates for Mount Sinai. But one of the more interesting mountains that he described to us is called Mount Karkon. There are indications that Har Karkon was a sacred mountain. It was one of many sacred mountains. What is unique to this particular mountain, Har Karkon, is the numbers of uh, petroglyphs. And petroglyphs naturally contains, uh, let's say, religious messages and symbolism. Where are we going? Har Karkom, Mount Karkom, which is in Israel. Very, very far from Egypt. But that's a very interesting mountain. Are we on a wild goose chase? or a sacred path. Mount Karkom just may be our Mount Sinai. Our search continues. We're looking for Mount Sinai, the holy mountain where Moses received the Ten Commandments from God. We've searched high and low on the Sinai Peninsula and we've ruled out two suspects. Santa Caterina and Sin Bisher. We're now on our way to see suspect number three, Mount Karkon, over 300 kilometers from Egypt in modern day Israel. We've rounded up a new man in our posse. His name is Hanoch Weiser. He's an expert on Karkon and he knows where to find the most convincing evidence. Then we go, we climb up here and we come down from over there. Oh, you got all the spots marked? Yeah. The first thing that Weiser points out to us is the acoustics in the area. When you stand on the mountain and someone talks from one kilometer away, you can hear him. I never considered that you would need a place where actually voices could carry. You could hear somebody giving a speech. Yeah. Yes, in the biblical story, 
the whole scenery is uh, accompanied with a lot of voice. voice a lot of yeah. voices is uh, in the story, and yes. uh, he writes that it's a very great acoustics. At its base, Mount Karkom has a Matzevot altar of the kind Uzi Avner described, standing stones which could be symbolic of the tribes of Israel. We find here a remains of altar with 12 standing stones, and the 12 stones remind us paragraph from the Bible about Moses who put the 12 stones uh, for each tribe one stone under the mountain of God. The mountain is surrounded by a very open, a big open space, which can accommodate a lot of people. Karkom checks out as an ideal site for the Israelite camp. And after hours of climbing, we come to a valley of petroglyphs, or rock drawings. We got 70,000 petroglyphs here, yes. 70,000. So you have to say, wait a minute, okay, this one mountain is saying, hello, I'm special, I'm different. Yes. Okay, yes. 70,000 petroglyphs, and it's not on any other mountain in the area, right? Or Sinai, or, I mean, it's unique, even if you look at it from a world yeah. point of view, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Weiser believes Mount Karkom is very special, and he shows us a petroglyph unique to this mountain. One of the most important petroglyphs on the mountain, and that's the drawing of the Ten Commandments. That's a very uh, special uh, petroglyph. We don't find petroglyph like this in all over the mountain and all over the area. There's a lot of coincidences on this mountain. <laughs> <laughs> it's either the mountain of God or the mountain of coincidences. <laughs> but Karkom's coincidences seem to defy the laws of chance. There's even archaeological proof that this mountain was a sacred place of worship before the time of Moses. In technical terms, we're, we're in a Paleolithic um, sanctuary, a place of worship. In lay terms, what it means is that this place is 30,000 years old. These sculptures would have established this mountain as a holy mountain, a place to worship, way before the Exodus. But that's exactly what the Bible says. It says that Moses, before the Exodus, went to the mountain of God, a place which was already known as the mountain of God. Uh, so it had to be a mountain with a tradition of holiness. Mount Karkom certainly checks out with our Sinai criteria. And it's all adding up to make it a prime candidate for the holy mountain. That is, until our posse discovers a glaring disconnect in the biblical clues. Disqualifying Mount Karkom as a potential Mount Sinai without any doubt. Basically, it has to meet all the criteria, it's the wrong mountain. Simple as that. The Sinai Posse has ruled out the third mountain from our list of suspects, Mount Karkom. Our reckoning is based on what can be called the biblical itinerary for the Exodus. The Bible says that the Israelites got the Ten Commandments 50 days after the Exodus. So you can kind of narrow it down a little bit, especially since there's a tradition that it took them a week to cross the divided sea, and they parked themselves for two weeks in a place called Elim, where there, there was water. Elim can be identified with a place known today as the Springs of Moses. In fact, the Bible reads like a travelogue, documenting Moses' and the Israelites' trip in great detail. They left Egypt on the 15th of the Hebrew month, Nisan. They crossed the sea on the 21st. They stayed in Etam for three days. They traveled to Elim and camped, arriving at the wilderness of Sin on the 15th of the month called Er. But most important for our search 
is the fact that it took the Israelites two weeks to travel from Elim to Mount Sinai. Two weeks to get to Mount Sinai. That gives you a bit of a geographical coordinate. If we figure a mass of people can only walk, say, what, 15 kilometers a day? Then you could put your compass point down on Elim, figure out 15 kilometers a day, 14 days, then you can draw an arc and figure out more or less where it is. If the Israelites had only two weeks to travel from Elim to Mount Sinai, there is no way that Mount Karkom could be the holy mountain. It's simply too far away. So, we've crossed Mount Karkom off the list. But now that we have a compass point in the desert, we can gather more clues and try to triangulate. You actually have compass points in the Bible telling you. People don't, don't read the Bible, but they go looking for Mount Sinai. For example, it says it's an 11 days journey from a place called Kadesh Barnea. And the Bible goes out of its way to say 11 days. That's a precise compass point. You could put your compass on Kadesh Barnea, multiply 15 by 11, 11 days at 15 kilometers a day, and actually have, figure out it couldn't be any further than this spot. The Sinai itinerary helps us build the perfect map. The Bible has provided our posse with two coordinates. Look at the beauty of it. It's not up here and it's not down here. It's right in the text. You got two, mm -hmm. two coordinates. And the most logical route. And, and it, yeah, the two coordinates happen to be on the most logical oh, yeah. route. But okay. to triangulate, right? If you want to triangulate, right? You need yeah. three coordinates. Mm -hmm. We need a third spot. This is a weird compass point, a little clue that the Bible gives you that nobody, nobody is actually focused on. It's my own uh, contribution to uh, the search for Mount Sinai, and that is Mount Sinai has to be within goat grazing distance from Midianite territory. What does a goat have to do with anything? Well, before Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, the Bible says he lived among these people called the Midianites, and he tended flocks, leading goats in the desert. Now, there's a little goat over here. Some Midianites. Some Midianites. That's the clue where Mount Sinai is. See the goat? See the goat? That's the clue to where Mount Sinai is, because Moses was leading the goat. <laughs> Yes, it's the goat that is key to the Mount Sinai mystery. It's these goats that will provide our posse with the third coordinate needed to find the holy mountain. But it's these goats that are going to take our posse some time to round up. So to find Mount Sinai, you're going to have to wait until next time on The Naked Archaeologist.